Hello, this is Angela, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope, and I'm standing here on the grounds of Pilgrim Center of Hope. Guiding people on Journeys of Hope is our passion, and as a nonprofit organization, we couldn't do it without you. Today, I'd like to thank our generous sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the Universal Church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope. This is your passport to sacred destinations around the world. And this program, produced by Pilgrim Center of Hope, provides you with a virtual pilgrimage to all the places associated with the history of our church and written about in Scripture. For the last 26 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led over 75 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Marian apparition sites, and beyond. And as a result of this, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to these holy sites so that you can experience what it is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. But not only that, but to learn, even though we may not even go to these places, but to learn about these places and how these places can relate today to our everyday lives wherever we are living. Welcome to this program. I'm Mary Jane Fox. Our programs are also available on podcast anytime and, there are, and on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. And if you're new to our program, we encourage you to look at our Journeys of Hope archive, which contains all previous episodes of the show, and there are many. We are an evangelization apostolate, and our mission is guiding people to Christ and the church. I invite you to learn more about this unique and vital ministry of evangelization at pilgrimcenterofhope.org. And when you do, you will find four major categories for Journeys of Hope, the Holy Land, the Saints, Marian, and Local. So there are so many ways that you can choose your um, whatever you want to discover as far as a pilgrimage destination. And again, Each episode not only takes you to the place, but also brings in a spiritual insight as per inspiration on how it can help us in our daily lives, which is so important. As Catholics, we are rich in having so many places we call our very own because they are related to our faith and our history. And again, you can listen anytime through our website and or on our podcast. Okay, now in today's episode of Journeys of Hope, we journey to Cassia, Italy, which is located in the region of Umbria, about two and a half hours northwest of Rome. And let me spell Cassia as C-A-S-C-I-A. It's a small village built on top of a mountain. The road leading to Cassia from Rome is narrow surrounded by a lot of greenery, trees, a stream, and hills. It's, it's, quite, it's quite beautiful, actually, and very quaint. The town of Cassia appears as a fortified castle and with stone hamlets built around the mountain. Uh, it was first founded during the Roman, imp- uh, Roman period and through time experienced, of course, the devastation of barbaric tribes and, and earthquakes. But this picturesque town overlooking the Umbria Valley is worth seeing. If you asked any most any Italian about Cassia, they would respond, Ah, Santa Rita, because Cassia today is known for its charming environment, good restaurants, offering the local specialties of handmade pasta with p- sausage. And the town's population is only about 3,200. However, on most weekends and feast days, Cassia receives hundreds of Italians and, yes, pilgrims. So what did the Italians mean when they said, Ah, Santa Rita? Well, we're talking about St. Rita of Cassia. 
St. Rita has placed Cassia on the map. On the top of the mountain is the Basilica of St. Rita with two levels, a large courtyard and a monastery under the custody of the Augustine religious community. Every weekend, Italians and others from throughout Europe will visit the shrine and spend the day in Cassia, which is quite easy to do. What is there to see? Not only the basilica itself, the monastery, a gift shop, coffee shops, and various restaurants and cafes where you can sit and enjoy the delicious local cuisine while overlooking the valley. However, one of the main reasons people come to Cassia is to see St. Rita, to spend time in the shrine, and to see the Eucharistic miracle associated with this area, and of course visit the monastery where she lived. Wait a minute, what did you mean by saying, what did I mean by saying that people want to see St. Rita? Yes, her body lies in a glass coffin inside the shrine, and her body is incorrupt. What does incorrupt mean? It is the quality or state of being free from physical decay. In other words, the body of St. Teresa has not deteriorated or decayed since her death in 1471. It's amazing. I have seen her body. I have visited Cassia. You know, she's dressed in her religious habit, and you can see her face, her teeth, her hands and feet. But before we hear about her amazing story, I'd like to tell you about how to get to the top of the mountain to see the shrine, a little bit about the monastery and the Eucharistic miracle. Since Kasher receives numerous visitors in a day, a parking lot is located at the foot of the mountain for cars, trucks, and buses. Yes, semi-trucks. We have seen them travel along the highways of Italy with an image of, uh, or a sticker of St. Rita of Cassia on their windows or on the side of the truck. So many have devotion to her. And so to reach to the top, you have a choice of climbing several flights of stairs or recently they've built a open escalator. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Along the way, you see charming oh shops and cafes and local villagers smiling. They are accustomed to the visitors almost every weekend and very hospitable. So now reaching the top, there's a narrow courtyard that leads you to the entrance of the shrine dedicated to the saint. It is a modern building of the 20th century, which took over nine bi- years to build. The church is is built of uh, travertine, which is a stone from that area that is similar to marble or granite. Travertine has been used for centuries as building material. The most famous structure built with it is the Colosseum in Rome. So you probably have seen pictures of the Colosseum and you can get an idea what kind of stone I'm talking about. So the church has a a Greek cross layout with four large apps and a central dome over the sanctuary. An artist carved some episodes of the life of St. Rita on the main doorway and inside. The dome has a dove, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And there are angels and saints, such as St. Rita and St. Augustine and others that are painted in this dome as well. The apse of the church, which is, which is the you know the main the front area, the sanctuary area, has a painting of the Assumption of Mary into Heaven, and this was painted in 1950, which was right after the proclamation of the dogma of the Assumption of Mary, as proclaimed by Pope Pius XII. The design of the stained glass windows depict the stories of the life of Mary. Isn't that beautiful? Just to Already walking in this church, you discover the life of St. Rita, you're remembering the church. Mother Church wants to tell us through sacred art in her buildings, you know, our, our, our faith, our creed, what we believe. It's, it's, it's just really a gift. To the left upon, um, so to the, when you enter the church to the left is the, is the chapel of Santa Rita, they call it, which houses her body. It opens behind a large wrought uh, iron gate. You know, she was never buried and, and she was placed in a coffin. And today, as I was saying, the, the, she's, her body's now in public display in, in a glass casket. And many faithful come to pray and light candles. 
Her body has remained corrupt and has even been reported to have moved positions. I know it sounds quite uh, unique and, and very strange, but, you know, it's a great mystery. We're going to go into that in a moment. But the religious sisters that live in a monastery have testified to that. On the four outer sides of the casket are four angels representing the four cardinal virtues, temperance, temperance, courage, justice, and prudence. There are lamps that hang from above, and the soft light provides an environment of sacredness, also given that sensation of mysticism. Along the walls are seven valuable canvases by an Italian artist depicting the life of St. Rita. Okay, St. Rita lived in the 15th century and her body's incorrupt. And as I said earlier, you can see her hands, her face, her feet. So let's look at what do we mean by incorrupt? Now, there are a little over 100 Catholic saints whose bodies are incorrupt. And these have been studied extensively. They are often called the incorruptibles. (laughs) Uh, There's a priest named Father Dwight Longnecker, an author who has written about this. Father Longnecker grew up in an evangelical home. He was ordained an Anglican priest, and in 1995, he and his family entered the Roman Catholic Church. So let's listen to what Father tells us about the incorruptibles. Okay, he says, this, is how, this is his explanation. There are saints whose mortal bodies have not fully decayed or been corrupted after death. Sometimes one particular limb or organ of a saint's body has not decayed, even though the rest of the body has done so. Remarkably, stories of saints' bodies that did not decay have been told from the very earliest times to the present day. The second century Roman uh, Saint Cecilia was reported incorrupt. And is the, so is the 19th century French Saint, uh, Saint Bernadette Subaru, who died in 1879 and wh- whose remains are with us still today and her body is incorrupt. Saint Bernadette was the one that Our Lady of Lourdes appeared to. When Saint John of the Cross died in 1591, he was buried in a vault beneath the floor of the church. When the tomb was opened nine months later, The body was fresh and intact, and when a finger was amputated to use as a relic, the body bled as a living person would have done. I know this is remarkable. I've always said Catholics get excited about relics and, you know, um, of saints because they're really, to me, signs of God's glory and yet a mystery. Let's continue to learn more about this. So, um, the tomb was opened a second time, this is at St. John of the Cross, about nine months after that, and the body was still fresh, despite the fact that it had been covered with a layer of quicklime, which was often used at that time period. At further exhumation, uh, uh, well, uh, what I'm trying to say is in about the late 19th century, the body was found to be still fresh, so from 1591 to the late 19th century. The last time the body was exhumed was in 1955, about 400 years later, and it was still moist and flexible, although the skin was slightly discolored. The phenomena are among the best document of any alleged miraculous occurrences. That's St. John of the Cross, and he was a Carmelite priest. Okay, you can see, um, you can go and see incorruptibles even now. Very often their bodies are in public display. Not only are they still visible, but the more recent um, exhumes were witnessed with oaths and affidavits by ordinary working people, as well as respectable professionals and clergy. Science and historical research well, may be able to explain some of the so-called incorruptibles. Nevertheless, once the natural explanations and the human interference are accounted for, an astounding number of cases remain unexplained. We simply don't know why saints' bodies are incorrupt. Though church authorities do not deny the possibility, the possibility of miraculous preservation of bodies, neither do they place much stock in it. According to Catholic Church, the strange phenomenon may confirm holiness, but on its own, 
the unnatural preservation of bodies does not automatically prove holiness. The authorities are more interested in the person's manifest virtue, which of course makes sense. In addition, the mere fact of a person's body being incorrupt does not guarantee sainthood. There have been instances of people who did not seem saintly, yet were also found incorrupt. In the meantime, however, the incorruptibles have much to teach us. They remind us that our faith is physical as well as spiritual. The incarnation of our Lord was a real historical event that was both supernatural and physical at the same time. The same is true of his resurrection from the dead. So the incorruptibles demonstrate that the spiritual world and the physical world are intertwined. We don't know all the precise rules of this interaction, but we know that what we do with our bodies affects our souls. And what we do in the spiritual realm affects our bodies. Boy, that's that's a lot to think about right there. The incorruptibles also provide a compelling sign that points to the resurrection of the dead. When all God's saints will receive back their bodies, incorruptible and transformed by His glory. And finally, the incorruptibles remind us that miracles happen. That this world is not quite as predictable as we may think. That God is at work in the world and that at any moment he might surprise us with new evidence of his power and his love. This was Father's um, great explanation. I believe it's a very good one. That was an explanation of the incorruptibles. Let us return to the chapel of St. Rita of Cassia. So many pilgrims, visitors, devotees visit the shrine of St. Rita and to ask her intercession. She is called the Saint of the Impossible. She is patron saint of difficult marriages, abused victims, loneliness, and widows. As you listen to her story, you will understand why she is invoked for these situations. And after we, we hear the story of St. Rita of Cassia, I'd like to tell you about the Eucharistic miracle uh, of Cassia as well. And we will discover the monastery where she lived and the famous rose and vine story related to St. Rita. And then we'll learn how this can help us in our own spiritual growth. Let's take a look at her story. Rita was a wife, a widow, mother, and a nun. She was born in 1381 in a village not too far from Cassia. She died at the age of 76 in a convent. She was the only child of her parents, and her parents looked at her as a special gift from God since she was born in their later years, and she was their only child. Her parents witnessed a strong faith in God. It was not surprising that Rita, who shared her parents' strong faith and religious devotion, would would have a desire to dedicate her life to God as a nun. Well, her parents had other plans. They wanted to see Rita married and had arranged a husband for her. Of course, she was disappointed, but she understood that her parents' choice was God's will for her, and so she consented. The situation at that time in Italy, both civil and ecclesiastical, were not healthy ones. There were frequent conflicts and family uh, battles settled by the rule of the vendetta on the social level. Well, Rita was married to Paolo Mancini. He was a good man, though he had a strong and impulsive character. And at times, he was... He, he um, was abusive to Rita um, because of his of his um, impulsive character. Um, but she remained faithful and patient. Uh, she loved her husband and she was faithful to their marriage. Their marriage was blessed with two sons, and Rita became a busy wife, mother, and housekeeper. Where her husband Paolo, uh, Paolo was employed as a, a minor civil servant. Well, he would often find himself drawn into the conflicts that existed between the rival political factions, and this may account for the tragedy which eventually touched their family. His violent outrages were at times taken out on Rita. 
Well, one day, as he was returning from work, Paolo was ambushed and killed. The pain which, which was... Um, which this unexpected and violent death imposed upon Rita was only compounded by the fear that her sons would seek to avenge their father's death. So her example of her forgiveness, her pleading and prayers for their change of heart were unable to move the boys, her sons, to forego any act of retaliation. They wanted revenge, and she prayed so much. She shed so many tears, begging her sons not to do this. So Rita, what what did she do? She entrusted the situation totally to God. She ran to God and begged God, asked him to handle the situation which was beyond her control. She was concerned for her son's souls. She didn't want them to commit a mortal sin through this revenge. Her sons died within a year of a sickness. They did not avenge their father's murderers. (laughs) What was important for Rita was her son's salvation. This is a remarkable story of a mother's love and concern for her children's souls. I must add here that a parent's prayer for their children is very efficacious. Your children are given to you as a gift from God. We know this. And as parents, you know, you are entrusted with their lives. But don't wait for a crisis to pray for your children you have an opportunity to give them a gift beyond compare by taking their current and future needs to God. Now, at whatever age, pray they will enjoy their God-given life, that they will have God's wisdom to handle life's challenges and learn from their mistakes. Pray for their future, their friends, employers, safety, their vocation, whether they be married or who knows, a, choose a single life or a, become a priest or religious. And when children realize their parents are, are, are praying for them, no matter what their age, it gives them confidence and assurance that they are loved and someone is truly concerned for them. You know, today I believe, I know, I know you would agree with me that the love of a parent is so vital, so crucial, so so powerful upon a child's mind and being, um, memory. You know, I myself can remember my my own parents. I mean, they, my parents loved us three children so much. She, they sacrificed. Um, they 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 made sure we had this balanced, you know, life of of recreation, education, um, cultural experiences, and. You know, it was just really beautiful having meals together, and and this is how I grew up. Now today, I mean, we're all every family is, is unique, but at the same time, the importance of of showing your children's love. You know, your children love to see their parents' uh, affection, uh, whether it be a that that kiss between a, a husband and wife or an embrace. Kids, you know, children love to see that. Uh, I remember, you know, my parents, uh, my father is now in heaven, my mother's still alive. However, when uh, even in their 63 years of marriage, I remember my father's um, wanting to give my mother flowers on certain days and would sign cards um, with hearts uh, with his name, uh, would call beautiful in terms of endearment to my mother in Spanish. Which, you know, when I heard them, my heart was just fluttered because I love to see the love between my parents, but it also, it also trickled down to us, the children. You know, St. Rita was so believed so much in this. She loved, she was so faithful to her husband and to her marriage and her children, her sons, and, and she prayed for them. And so the fruit of that was, you know, God, uh, Helped her, helped her sons, and they did. Um, um, they did die, but it was in a in the, in the state of, of grace. Thanks be to God. So we're talking about a little town in Cascia, Italy, about two, I'd say two and a half hours northwest of Rome. Small village, little farm, country road that leads you there. Uh, two lanes only. Uh, there's a lot of trees and greenery surrounding this area. The Italian people, 
seem to uh, have this great deep devotion. When I was there, I, I, I just witnessed such a beautiful joy and uh, a light, um, you know, just a, a fresh air in the sense of seeing this this um, this joy and families coming together, visiting the shrine is very enlightening and very encouraging. Um, and so again, you know, the, the village of Cassia, St. Rita of Cassia has placed it on the map, as I said before. Her body's incorrupt. She's dressed as a, in her nun's habit, which is the Augustinian, uh, St. Augustine's religious community. And their founder is St. Augustine of Hippo. And she is dressed in her black habit. Uh, you can see her face, uh, her, some of her teeth, her hands are laying above her, her body, her feet are exposed. Um, it's not like uh, you would see uh, each other as a, you know flesh, as described earlier of St. John of the Cross. Uh, it's darkened. It looks like it's you know quite old because it is. She died in 1471, but the fact that it has not decayed, that's why it's called incorrupt. You know, uh, she, we were saying that she was um, married, her, her husband was murdered, her two sons died, and now uh, she's left alone. You know, read a story of praying for her sons is very powerful, very encouraging for us that um, to know that, you know, have her deep lo- faith and love for them. But now she's alone. Rita gave herself to works of charity and to a more intense life of prayer. Her desire to enter the convent grew, and she requested to enter the Augustinian convent at St. Mary Magdalene Convent in Cassia. So she was refused not once, but three times. Now, Rita was known to the nuns of that convent because they knew, they knew of her good character and her good works and her deep faith and strong religious spirit. However, the, the nuns were concerned of tempting the peace of the convent life, possibly because one of their members belonged to the family responsible for the husband's murder. So did Rita give up? Oh, no. She felt deeply that this was the vocation to which she was called, and she turned to her patron saints to intercede for her. She approached her husband's family as well as their rivals and persuaded them to put an end to their hostility and to live in peace. Now, this took some time. The example of her own forgiving spirit no doubt was an inspiration to both, and the families did reconcile eventually. Well, they signed a document to this effect, and when Rita presented the document to the nuns, they no longer had reason to refuse her. She then became Sister Rita. For the next 40 years, Sister Rita lived in the the life of an Augustinian nun, according to the rule of St. Augustine of Hippo. His was a gentle rule which invited the members of the community to strive in every way possible to achieve communion of mind and heart with God and with one another. Her days were spent in prayer and contemplation in service to the sick and the poor. The last 15 years of her convent life, when Rita was around 60 years of age, she was given what she considered a most treasured and singular gift from God. Always devoted to Jesus crucified, her desire um, constantly grew to share in his great act of love for her and for all humanity by helping to carry his cross. One day, it was actually on Good Friday, she knelt in prayer. Her forehead was pierced by a wound, a thorn from the crown that covered Jesus' own head. It was considered to be a partial stigmata. And she bore this external sign of union with Christ until her death in in, um, in 1471. Now, this is remarkable. A partial stigmata. The stigmata are the marks of Jesus crucified on a body. St. Francis of Assisi had the stigmata. Padre Pio had the stigmata. Partial stigmata is the case of St. Rita, where she just, on her forehead only, did she have a thorn that pierced her forehead. During the last four years of her life, Rita was confined to bed and was able to eat so little that she was practically sustained only on the Eucharist alone. One of those who visited her her some months uh, before her death was a relative from her own hometown. When her relative asked Rita 
if she had any special desires, Sister Rita asked that a rose from her garden, well, from the garden of her parents' home, be brought to her. It was a small favor to ask, but it was something that Sister Rita wanted. Well, her, her relative thought it, this would be impossible because it was the month of January, a season that wouldn't provide roses in that region. Nevertheless, on returning to um, a home, Rita's relative, Rita's relative discovered, much to her amazement and her surprise, a single brightly colored blossom on the bush where the nun said it would be. So she picked it, she returned immediately to the monastery and presented it to Sister Rita, who gave thanks to God for the sign of his love. This is another reason she became known as the advocate of all those whose own requests seem impossible as well. Well, she died on May 22nd at the age of 76, and at the time of her death, the sisters of the convent bathed and dressed her body for burial. They noticed that her forehead, the wound on her forehead remained the same, with drops of blood still reflecting like some light. When her body was later exhumed, it was noted that her forehead wound remained the same. Uh, it had that glistening light reflected from with some drops of blood. Her body showed no signs of deterioration. Over several years, her body was exhumed two more times. And each time, her body appeared the same. So she was declared an incorrupt after the third um, time that she was exhumed. Relics were taken at that time, as is the custom in the Catholic Church, in preparation for her sainthood. Her feast is, is observed in the Catholic Church calendar on the anniversary of her death, which is May 22nd. The various crosses she experienced as a wife, a widow, a mother, and nun were now put aside once and for all as she met the embrace of her risen Lord. She was canonized in Rome in May of the year 1900 by Pope Leo XIII. Rita is invoked as the saint of the impossible because of the exemplary way in which she met with the many difficulties and crosses in her own life and turned them into instruments of growth and holiness before God. You know, St. Rita leaves with us her message of forgiveness, peace, love, suffering, humility, and joy. You can see a photo of her incorrupt body and obtain a prayer asking her intercession on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Let's look at the monastery. The Augustinian monastery where St. Sister Rita lived for 40 years is still active today. The nuns care for the shrine. They receive visitors and pilgrims and provide the blessed rose petals. Rose petals that are blessed are given to the visitors almost on a daily a weekly basis and um, this is this is the tradition of that miracle of the rose of uh, from her parents garden so it's it's a it's 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 like a sacramental it's a sign of just a devotion to saint rita um so the the sisters today in the convent their time is spent in silence and prayer and daily service to others and especially receiving the numerous pilgrims and visitors that come and visit the area in the courtyard of the convent, there is a vine that produces delicious grapes, and there's a story behind this vine. The superior of the convent asked Sister Rita, who was just a novice, to water a dry twig in the garden to test her obedience. Rita humbly obeyed and drew water daily from the well and watered this dry twig. God turned the dry twig into a thriving vine that produces fruit today. In fact, even the leaves from the vine are used as a souvenir of the convent. Um, as you know, there's fruit in obedience, especially to obedience to truth. So this is um, t certainly a testimony to that. Uh, that the cell of Saint uh, Rita, of Sister Rita, where the saint lived and died, is also located in a monastery. And the original wooden casket, which kept Rita's body in the, uh, in the very beginning at her, of her death in the 15th century, can still be seen there. Uh, now, let's look at the Eucharistic Miracle. The Eucharistic Miracle is located right there at the lower level of the Shrine of St. Rita of Cassia. And it is preserved. Now, this miracle happened 
1330, a priest in Siena, which is around 30 miles from Cassia, was asked to administer the Holy Eucharist to a dying sick man in his town. Well, of course, Father, this priest agreed to do this request, but he uh, irreverently placed the consecrated hose between the pages of his breviary, and his, his, which is his prayer book, instead of placing it in a pyx, which is a small container used to carry sacred hosts to the sick, and, and then placing it close to your heart as you're carrying it. So when he had uh, arrived at the sick man's house and opened the breviary to give him the, uh, the communion, he found that the sacred hose was bleeding, and there were round stains of blood on the two pages of the, of the prayer book where it, where it was placed. Well, he immediately repented for what he had done and rushed to the nearby Augustinian monastery in Siena to confess, and he told what, uh, Father Simon what had happened. Father Simon was known uh, at that time for his holiness and his, his, and his wisdom. So Father Simon granted absolution to the repentant priest, but he asked to take the two pages uh, from that prayer book and brought them to the Augustinian monastery in Cassia, where he placed them in a reliquary, which is a vessel that contains relics or sacred items. Were blessed items. The pages have been preserved and numerous tests were performed confirming the blood was human blood. In 1389, 89 years after the miracle occurred, the Pope confirmed the authenticity of the miracle. And to this day, the stains of the precious blood can still be seen on the pages of the breviary, which are preserved in the lower chapel of the Basilica of St. Rita in Cassia. The fragment of parchment paper measures around, oh, two inches, and it's kept in a stone and crystal tabernacle bordered by two marble panels, which symbolize the two sides of an open prayer book. The relic of the Eucharistic miracle has been venerated by the faithful for centuries, and various popes promoted its veneration with special indulgences, because it, it is truly a Eucharistic miracle. Well, this miraculous event is also commemorated every year on the Feast of Corpus Christi when, when the relic is carried solemnly in procession throughout the, the village of Cassia. So when we celebrate the Feast of Corpus Christi in our own hometowns, we'll have to remember in Cassia, imagine they're processing uh, with this beautiful Eucharistic miracle in its reliquary through the streets of Cassia. You know, when an extraordinary minister, someone who is appointed in their parish to, uh, to distribute the Holy Eucharist to the sick in hospitals or in homes, they're instructed to carry the Blessed Sacrament, the Sacred Host, properly and with reverence. The Pyx, it's spelled P-Y-X, is a blessed vessel made flat like a watch to carry the Sacred Host. It's like a miniature ciborium. Uh, they become they come in various sizes. Some hold one to four sacred hosts, uh, or some are a bit larger to hold more. And these are especially used for hospital chaplains, uh, priests, or ministers visiting the sick in their homes. The pyx is then placed in a in a small leather carrier, just enough to carry the pyx with a cord that hangs around your neck, so that the pyx is carried. Um, around you uh, and hangs in front of your heart of the, of the person carrying the sacred host. This is the proper way to carry the blessed sacrament for distribution to the sick. The sacred host is the Eucharist, the real body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to recall the words of Jesus, our Savior, recorded in the Gospel of, of John, chapter 6, verse 55. These are the words of our Lord. He says, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. The body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ is present in every fragment of the consecrated host and in every single drop of the precious blood. By his real presence in the Eucharist, Christ fulfills his promise to be with us always until the end of the age, as we read in the Gospel of Matthew 28, 20. The body and blood of Christ, present, which is present under the appearances of bread and wine, are treated with the greatest reverence both during 
and after the celebration of the Eucharist, of the Mass. The body of Christ under the appearance of bread that is kept or reserved in the tabernacle after Mass is commonly referred to as the Blessed Sacrament. And that is why we need to genuflect when we, we, we are in front of the tabernacle. It is our Lord Himself who is present in the Blessed Sacrament, and we need to bow down and show Him the utmost reverence and adoration to Him. The Eucharistic miracle that can be seen in Kasha today is a testimony of this truth. You can see the blood-stained pages that the sacred host um, that held the sacred host in the year 1330. What a miracle! And of course, there have been well, I say of course, I, I'm aware, and maybe some of us are aware as well. But there have been Eucharistic miracles throughout the years, and I believe our merciful Lord wants us to realize to see and believe that truly the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, is His gift to us. The real presence, um, you know, the, the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist is a sign of Jesus' love that He left for us so that we may receive Him as often as possible. Of course, we receive Him at, at Mass on Sundays, but if possible, even during the week at daily weekday Masses. He, remain, he remains with us still, in that sacred host. Pope John Paul II was um, often heard say, heard uh, saying, in that little host is the solution to the problems of the world. And that so true, isn't it? Because that little host is consecrated. It's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Wow, praise God. Now, here are some points that we can take to for our spiritual insight, for inspiration. And we can certainly learn from St. Rita of Cassius so much. But I'd like to point out some, some, some things. You know, never lose your trust in God, even when life seems impossible. The, the goings-on in life may seem impossible, but that doesn't mean that there is no God or that He doesn't care about you, unlike what many people usually say to defend their unbelief in God. Our Lord says that He cares about the great things down to the smallest details of our life. We hear the Lord telling us in the Gospel of Luke 12, 6-7, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten because before God. Why? Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. God remembers birds that people sell for next to nothing. They are a small consequence to humans, yet are rem- yet we are remembered by God. Jesus tells us we are worth much more than that. Of God, of course God cares. He cares enough to number the hairs on our heads. It's incredible to think about. That's enough to ponder. You know, and as, as we suffer, be consoled knowing that Jesus is suffering with you, with us. St. Rita, prayed, she prayed devoutly for many years for the conversion of her, of her husband and the conversion of her sons. Her confidence in God never wavered. She knew that God would not abandon her, her pleas. She knew God was hearing her pleas. We need to put our full trust in God that when we pray fervently, He will send graces and help. St. Paul's words from Philippians 4, 6 tells us, Do not be anxious about anything. Never lose your trust in God, even when life seems impossible. Another point we can learn is during desperate times, turn to sacredness, not to self-damage. Some people shun from being sacred and would rather turn to self-damage acts when they feel that times are too desperate and there's nothing more that they can do. We've all been tempted with this. Again, you know, that's why the mercy of God is so omnipotent. He gives us the sacrament of reconciliation to help us in these times because we are remorse when we do have those temptations or perhaps fall into that sin. St. Rita, even though she went through a lot with her when her husband was murdered and her sons dying at a young age, she did not resort to ruining her own life or her own self. Instead, she turned to God and persevered in in her prayer for her sons. She prayed they wouldn't take revenge on their father's murder. She, She prayed for them not to commit this mortal sin. 
and they died before committing that sin. She knew the most important thing was their salvation. While it was a deep suffering for her as a mother to lose her only two sons, her faith sustained her and her hope gave her courage to move on. You know, she believed in in the gift of eternal life as we need to each day and be remembered of that gift God has given us, the gift of eternal life. And that is our destination, the heavenly Jerusalem. And so, you know, of course, that was when she entered the convent and became a nun. You can't heal a wound by inflicting another wound. In the same way many people face with problems like depression, sometimes they mask their their issues and pains by not opening up and pushing away the very people who love them and care for them. They instead resort to addictions or hanging out with bad friends and find reasons to defend themselves for sticking with those vices or people. That's a self-damaging way of coping. And if you ever find yourself or your loved one at the brink of such action, be reminded that God's way, which is sacred and merciful, is the only way by which anyone can get through in this temporary life on earth and preserve one's soul for eternal life. And let's, let's hear the words of St. Paul again. And this is from Philippians 4.13. They're very encouraging. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let me repeat that. I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. Let's look at another point. Be prudent in your choices when faced with tough situations. All those years that her husband treated her badly and unkindly, Rita chose to love him with kindness and offered prayers for him. She also prevented her sons from making the immoral choice. When others treat us unjustly, we should not choose to take revenge. No, at times at, at times of tough situations, you may be tempted to take some form of revenge against those who hurt you by hurting them too in words and actions. Let God serve his justice and deal with your enemies according to his will. That's especially true when the problems are our loved ones themselves. If you want them converted to have the same virtues and to love as you do, God may will it God may will it that it doesn't happen overnight, but gradually instead. In the like in the case of Saint Rita, but God hears our prayers and our cries. Each day be a kind example to them. You can deal with them with peace by being prudent and making small choices of returning cold-hearted acts to you with simple acts of love, understanding, kindness, and compassion, and sometimes just plain silence. This is how, as Catholics, we bear the crosses in daily life. But as we do, remember that when we do unite that with Christ, we, we carry the cross with Christ, He will, will never outdo our generous offering up of our sufferings. He, he uh, is more generous with his graces. This is um, the good news. And through your prayers, trust in God's grace and mercy that sooner or later, he will touch their hearts, soften their hardened spirits, and allow them to be converted to honor and love you, and of course, love God. In the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 5, 7, we read, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So these were beautiful points that we can, you can learn from St. Rita's life and think about and ponder. We all, we all have family members that we're concerned about or situations or friends, and certainly St. Rita uh, can help us. Now, my husband, Deacon Tom, and I have led pilgrimages to Italy, including Cassia. And, you know, the country of Italy is rich in ancient history and art, especially Catholic history, because the Christian population in that area from the beginning was very faithful, dedicated, and united. Many Christians were martyred in Rome during the first couple of centuries of Christianity. Today, throughout Italy, and most especially around Rome, you will find many holy sites, such as the catacombs, shrines with tombs of of apostles and saints, relics and museums, and, oh yes, some incorruptibles. 
that all hold evidence and art of historical events and persons that made a difference. As I said, Cascia is not far from Rome, and it's a picturesque village of stone buildings, cobblestone pathways built on top of a mountain in a, in a unique place. St. Rita has certainly made Cascia well known throughout the world, and people from all over will visit the small village to pray in the church of St. Rita, to venerate her relics and see where she lived. Her life of faithfulness as a woman wife, mother, widow, nun, assures us all of the possibilities available for us to grow in holiness, no matter our situation or state of life. She lost her two sons at a young age. That in in itself is a deep suffering for a mother. And that is why she is called the saint of the impossible. Over the years, Catholics in various countries have witnessed to St. Rita's intercession and attributed numerous miracles to her. Many continue to ask her for her help, especially in their hopeless and impossible circumstances. Her intercessory prayers can assist us. And again, you know, I just want to invite you to... um, to think about her life, go to our website and and there's a prayer to St. Rita asking her intercession on our website and a picture of her incorrupt body. And again, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the incorruptibles is certainly a mystery, but they, they, they could be signs of of um, just God's, God's presence. And as Father Dwight Lawnegger so beautifully explained to us that it is... Our faith really is the combination of our spirit and body. And so this is, um, again, a a great sign for us um, in in our church today. Well, we're just about out of time for today's episode of Journeys of Hope. And as is our tradition, before we go, we want to give you a, um, a jewel for the journey, a spiritual gem from scripture or a saint or pope that you can reflect on throughout the week and collect. Well, today's jewel is from St. John Paul II. When you wonder about the mystery of yourself, look to Christ who gives you the meaning of life. That's where our true meaning is, is in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. So I'd like to join you, uh, I'd like to ask you to join me in the closing prayer. And uh, this closing prayer is Um, just asking the Lord for his blessing. Yes, indeed. And I want to invite you to also visit us at Pilgrim Center of Hope. We're an evangelization ministry founded uh, 27 years ago. Very vital ministry needed, giving out the spreading the good news through, yes, pilgrimages, but conferences, evangelization outreach, uh, events, parish programs, social media, weekly blogs, and this program, Journeys of Hope. We are here to guide people to Christ and the church. So join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you are faithful in all things. Your promises endure forever, and there is no limit to your miracles. In your hands, all things are possible. You are the one who conquered death and made a place for us in heaven. May we never cease to sing your praise. In your name we pray, amen. And let's add, St. Rita of Cassia, pray for us. We've come to the end of our journey of, uh, for today. Thank you for joining me on Journeys of Hope. And learn about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and evangelization outreach. Visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org and call us, 210 210- 521-3377, 210-521-3377. You know, we are a pilgrim people striving to live our journey of hope each day with boldness, passion, and joy. May the Lord bless you abundantly. Journeys of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.